Okay, so um, last time we took a look at some uh, binary information. A binary digit is a bit. And today we're going to continue that. Uh, we're quantifying how to deal with uh, information in a computer system. And so we, last time we said a uh, bit, a binary digit. Now the abbreviation for a bit is a lowercase b. Okay, so a notation. It's a lowercase b. All right, so that's a bit. Now, the thing about quantifying digital information, the next thing that we really have to know is a byte. It's spelled B-Y-T-E, but it's pronounced byte as in <laughs> have a byte. Okay? And you know how many bits are in a byte? Eight. Eight. So a byte is eight bits. All right, and the notation for a byte is an uppercase B. So notation, big B. So a big B is a byte and a little b is a bit, and there's eight bits in a byte. Remember in figure 1.9 is our model of all computer systems. There's a disk, there is, and that disk could be either a physical disk with a physical platter and a read-write head, or it could be a solid state disk, but at any rate, it's a disk. And then on, on the one end, and then on the other end, we have main memory. And main memory consists of a collection of, uh, that's where uh, information is stored. And then in the middle, we have the central processing unit, the CPU. Now, um, the thing about this system, this computer system, as shown in figure 1.10, <clears throat> is that information flows from one part of the system to another part. Okay, and we, we looked at how this statement J gets I plus one executes. So I and J are um, variables and they, their values are stored in main memory and to compute them, information has to flow from main memory over the bus to the CPU in one direction and then in the other direction it can flow from the CPU over the bus to main memory. And we also saw this, um, remember this phenomenon where the CPU is bypassed, what's that called? Direct memory access, where the information flows from the disk over the bus and it bypasses the CPU and goes straight into memory or the other way around. Okay, now in all of these cases, what's happening is information is flowing from one part to another part. This happens all the time. On your cell phone, information flows from your phone to the cell tower, from the cell tower to your phone. And that connection in between the source and the destination of the information flow is called a channel. All right? And the thing about quantifying information flow over a channel, that's done by this quantity that is called the bandwidth. All right? And so here on this slide is the bandwidth equation. And um, what it tells us is that the amount of information that you get in an information transfer is equal to the information per time times the time. And by information in this, this quantity, information per time, that quantity, information per time, is called the bandwidth. All right? Does everybody see what we're talking about? Yeah. Will those two not cancel out? Yeah, notice that the units cancel out. And so what happens is if you have, if, you're, if, if your information is flowing at so many, you know, so many bits per second and then times the number of seconds it flows, that's how many bits gets, tra gets transferred. So that's, that's the idea. And, and which brings us to what are the units of information? A bit is, is the smallest unit of information, the smallest unit of digital information. It's, is, is the bit. So the bandwidth is typically measured in bits per second. Does everybody see? And depending on, and see, different channels have different uh, capacities to handle information flow. So a big bandwidth channel can have more bits per second flowing through it than a small one. Do you see what we're saying? For example, if your antennas are way separated, way far, the bandwidth might go down because you could get fewer less information flowing from the source between the source and the destination. Do you have a question? Yeah, when you say channel, is that like 
The channel is the me yeah, good question. The channel is the medium between the source and the destination of the flow of information. Outside of in, the well, in this particular case, in this particular example that we saw a minute ago, the channel was the bus. Okay. The system bus is the channel. And by the way, I never did explain exactly what that system bus is. Let's, let's learn that now. The bus is nothing more than a group of wires. That's what it is. That line, the system bus along the bottom, that is just a group of wires. Literal, literal copper wires. That's, that's the channel. And the signal flows through that. As opposed to like wireless, where the signal is flowing via electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation from the source to the destination through space. You see, but you see, but it's the same idea. It's yeah. all, all, yeah, it's, it's the same idea. The information flow. But the, the main thing is, is that information flows, you, you measure information flow by uh, by bits per second. That, those are the units. And then bytes per second, you divide by eight. Oh. See, so anyway. All right, so here, let's just do an example. Because you know, here, remember we said that, well, let's go ahead and go back to it. Let's go to figure 1.12. In figure 1.12, what we see is, remember we said that the input ports and the output ports are wired into main memory. What is this design called? where the inputs and the outputs of the system are wired into main memory. What is that called? That has a term. Some term. Yeah, say it again. Memory. That's memory mapped I.O. It's called memory mapped I.O. So we saw that in PEP9 computer it's memory mapped I.O. And so what happens is like that input could be a keyboard. The keyboard could be wired into that input. So as you're typing keys on the keyboard, every time you press a key, oops, <laughs> I turn on the computer. <laughs> every time you uh, Every time you press a key, then information is going, f is going from that input port over that bus to the CPU. All right, so here is a little exercise to show how, how uh, to quantify um, the bandwidth. Exer example 1.3, a typist is entering some text on a computer keyboard at the rate of 35 words per minute. How large must the bandwidth of the channel be to accommodate the information flow between the typist and the computer system? Assume that each word is followed by one space character. You know, you type my, space, dog, space, has, space, fleas, period. So a space after each word. So assume that um, each word is followed by one space character on average. So including the one space character after each word, the type of center is how many characters per second? Or, sorry, per minute? 36. Okay. So what is the bandwidth? Now what's the definition of bandwidth? Right, so equals by definition of bandwidth, information per time. Oh. In order to solve this problem, we need to know what? How many characters per How many bits per... No, well, per, per, per character. We need to know how many bits per character. Oh, that takes us back to the... Um, ah. Let's pause. That takes us back to this principle. Figure 1.18. What does figure 1.18 say? The number of values stored by a sequence of what? N bits is what? Two to the N. To the N. How many letters are in the English alphabet? Uppercase and lowercase makes that what? Well, you double what? 52. And then all the digits, characters, that's another what? Maybe, you know, zero, the character zero, character one, so that's like 62. Punctuation marks, blah, 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 blah. About how many? About how many? Yeah, then how many characters all together, maybe? Over, maybe around 100, maybe a little over. Okay, but now here's the, so how many bits does it take to store 100 characters? Whoa, 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 figure 1.18. How many bits would it take to store? How many different values do we need to store in, in a character, like around 100? So at 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. So you could actually store them all, 128. You could actually store them all in what? Seven bits. In fact, if you look at the inside back cover of the book, 
Does anybody have the book? It's kind of heavy. Look at the inside back cover of the book. There's a table there. What is that table called? American Standard Code for Information Interchange. That is, okay, so that's, that's ASCII, A-S-C-I-I, and it's a seven-bit code, and you see all the letters and the punctuation marks there. Are you with me? Now, but typically what happens in, the, in a computer is compu uh, information is stored in chunks of what? Instead of chunks of seven, it's chunks of what? Eight. So that's typically what happens is eight bits per character. And does everybody, not everybody see, follow all that? Are we good? All right, so that's, so we needed that little extra piece of information. So it's information per time. So we substitute the values, and so how many, so it's eight bits per character. Are you with me? That's where we got the eight. Okay, so eight bits per character times, 30, times 36 characters. All right, so that's how many bits go, have to go over the channel per minute, right? And then we multiply that times 60 seconds per minute. Is everybody clear on this? We're just canceling units and multiplying out. Are we good? Okay, so you do the math, and what you come out with is 4.8 bits per second. That's the bandwidth. That's an example of bandwidth. Very low. Super low. Okay, thanks for the correction. <laughs> All right, now, um, you guys know what QR codes are? Quick response codes? These rectangular things? Now, these, this is a really visual um, representation of binary, because in a QR code, what happens is the uh, space, the region is, the square region is subdivided into a grid of tiny squares, and each one of these squares is called a module, and, and a black one represents a one, and a white one represents a zero. And so you can actually see right there that that's visually how binary takes, takes up space. Binary storage takes up space. And in fact, in a memory system, in a, in a memory chip, it's the same kind of thing, except instead of each square being a black or a white, it's a, the, all the electronic circuitry in order to store one bit. Mm -hmm. so, so since each character is a eight bits, like you would have to count eight squares? Yes, yes, letter. yes, yes. And there, there, and, and you can tell there are different, there are, there are different versions of QR codes and the one on part B is obviously stores more information because there's more room in there for, uh -huh. for storing. And then different regions of the QR code are, are, are reserved f not for the information itself, but for alignment and things like that. So there, there's, we're not going to go into the detail, but the details are all in the book. It's very interesting. So these are the format regions, and here in figure 1.22, you see there's a, there, there's a finder pattern on three of the corners, so it doesn't make any difference if it's upside down or sideways or whatever, the software can determine the three corners and, and adjust it accordingly. And then there's a timing patterns that, that are this alternating black and white ones and zeros, and there are the alignment patterns. Here's a version three QR code, and here in figure, part B of the figure is a version seven part of the code, and you can see how the Alignment patterns overlap the the, um, the yeah the timing patterns overlap the alignment pattern so that the alignment pattern does not mess up the timing pattern. You see how that works. And if you go back here to this part of the to this um, figure 1.21b, you can can you detect those uh, those squares in there? And so and so the and it's the other regions that are that store the actual binary information. And then there's error correction and detection in these QR codes. But the main thing is, this visually shows you that binary storage requires space. Are you with me? We live in a space-time universe and the binary uh, uh, storage in binary requires space. So this is the information about the QR information code and bits, and you can read about that in the... Um, in the book, we're not going to take the time to investigate it, but it's a qu quite an interesting application of this idea that information is stored in binary as ones and zeros. Now, what about images? Like images are produced by printers, they're produced on monitors. How is information stored for an image? In figure 1.24, we have four different representations of the letter P, uppercase P. 
And so basically, visually, you have this rectangular region. In part A, the rectangular region is 5 by 8. And each block of the letter P, or each block in this region is either dark or light. And the dark squares form the outline of the character P. And then you can get better resolution in part B by, in, by increasing the uh, resolution of the square. So instead of being 5 by 8, it's 11 by 16. The P looks a little bit more rounded. And then on the other hand, if you have not a uh, laser writer, like in, in a laser writer, black and, white, black and white laser printer, the dot is formed by the toner, and it's either the dot is there or not. So that's either you know a one or a zero. But on the other hand, if you have a screen of computer monitor, you can have grayscale. So in part C of the figure is the letter P with grayscale. So instead of being each section being dark or light, it's shades of gray in between. And you can see that in part D, that's the best rendering of the letter P. It has a higher resolution, 11 by 17 field and grayscale. So the question is, how do you store this information in binary? In figure 1.25, we see in part A of the figure that storage for the image in figure 1.24a, the P, and you see basically what happens is you just assign a 1 or a 0 depending on if the square is dark or light. Now do you see how that works? Okay, you can see the ones, you see the ones form the outline of the P, I mean form the image of the P. All right. But now in part B of the figure, what happens is, this is, what, this is in a monitor, like if you have a grayscale. And now how many values can be, now each, now each, each um, region, each little sub-pixel of the region has how many bits? Three, right? And how many values can you store with three bits? Eight. So what this means is that there's eight shades of gray. Are you with me? And you see the upper left corner is 111, that's all black. And you see the lower right hand corner, that's what? 000, zero, zero. that's all what? That's white. So 111 is black, 000, zero, zero is white. And if you see the bottom row, second from the left, what's that value? 010. So do you see the little rectangle in P, the, see the little square in P that that corresponds to? That's this gray, this 010 is this gray box. Does everybody see how that works? All right. Yeah. So why can you store eight pieces of information in three bits? Zero, 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 one, zero, oh. one, zero, zero, one, one, oh. one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, one, one. There they are. Eight. <laughs> are you with me? Yes. Is, is, there, is everybody clear on that? So eight. So this, this would be eight shades. And if you have want to have more, uh, you know, if you had four bits, you could store how many shades of gray? Sixteen. Sixteen. Is everybody clear on how that works? Okay. Now here's the thing. What about color? How's color? How do we store color? Well, it's the same idea, but instead each little pixel on your screen is subdivided into what? Well, here. It's sub in figure 1.28. Each little sub-pixel in your screen is subdivided into what? Red, Red green, and blue. RGB. Are you with me? Okay. And so in figure 1.28a is a single color pixel with three sub-pixels. And then in part B, there's a 16 by 8 pixel portion of a color display. Is everybody clear? So now instead of having a single pixel having a value, which is a shade of gray, we have what? Yeah, yeah. We have, we have to have a value for red and a value for green and a value for blue for each pixel, right? And here what happens is... Um, uh, the book, I don't want to go into it, it's quite complicated actually, but in figure 1.26, you know that when um, we get light from the sun and it's white, but when it, you put it through a prism, it's what? What do you see? A rainbow, right? So white is actually a mixture of many different colors, right? 
And so um, the pure color, a pure color is a single wavelength. A pure color of light is a single wavelength. And in figure 1.28 or 1.26, these, these are the colors of the spectrum. Okay? And what, but what happens is in, our, in your eye, your eye has cones and rods. You know which ones detect the color? Uh, I think the rods are black and white. Is that right? Do we, not, do we not have any biology people in here? I know we do. You know who you are. <laughs> I think the cones are color, right? And there's three kinds of cones. There's a small SML, a small, medium, and long wavelength. And this picture in figure 1.27 shows how each one, the sensitivity of each one to the different wavelengths of light. Now can you tell that if you have a pure 500 nanometer light wave coming in, which cones get excited? Actually, all of them do. You see, it's, it's in the region for... But if you have 600, which cones are getting, ex, getting excited? The M's and the L's, but not the S's. Do you see what we're saying? Because of this, it's complicated. Because of this response of the cones to the light, it's possible to have different mixture of wavelengths produce the same image of color in your mind. You realize that color is only in your mind. It's a phenomenon of your mind, of the human mind. Does everybody see what we're saying? And it's actually possible to have two different mixtures of wavelengths coming in to produce the same color in your mind because, it, because you, can, you can excite these cones different ways. I mean, you can excite them with different wavelengths to produce the same response in the cones. Do you see what I mean? So it's, it's all... It's quite uh, complicated. Very interesting topic. Figure 1.29 shows the mixtures of colors to produce, the mixtures of wavelengths to produce the colors in your mind. So typically what happens is, now what we've shown here is that the maximum value is 255 for each subpixel. So how many bits would that be? Two, four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256. So from 0 to 255. So that's how many bits per subpixel? 8. It's 8 bits per subpixel. Does everybody see that? So if you have 255 red, 255 green, 255 blue, what, what image, what does that produce to the eye? White. See, the eye can't distinguish the subpixels, so they're blended into just the one white color. Is everybody clear? And then 192, 192, 192 is silver. 128, 128, 128 is gray. 000 is black. And then all 255 for red and 0 and 0 for green and blue, that produces red in the eye. Yeah. In the mind. And this is only for like digital color, right? This is if the pixel is red, green, and blue. And what the intensity level of each one is, and, that, and then it produces that sensation of that color in the mind. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. Does the number of bits per pixel depend, or does it change depending on like screen size? It absolutely does, yes. This 256 is a common one for desktop computers, a mobile device, uh, automobile display, uh, ebook reader, they're all, they, they can all choose, these systems can all have different color depths, different numbers of bits. That's a good question. And so the question is, how do you quantify this? So here we go, example 1.7. A GPS system in an automobile has 4.5 by 2.5 inch screen with 120 color pixels per inch. Each subpixel color can display 64 levels of brightness. What is the kilobyte size of the display memory? So how are we going to calculate this? You understand that, that the image has to be stored, the image on the display is stored in memory. How many bits, how many kilobits does it take to store that color display? So how are we going to do this? It's first you need to find the area. The, yes, the area. And then it says 120 pixels per inch. So the total number of pixels is what? It's the product of what? 
the number of pixels one number of pixels width number of pixels height multiply that that's the total number of pixels are you with me so what is that's the product of what number in the width times the number in the height so that's equal to what substitute the values what so how many how many in the width and how many in the height well it's 4.5 inches at a what 120 per inch so how many pixels Times, right? Yeah. Yeah, so 4.5 inches times 120 pixels per inch. I'm not. Are you with me? Times what? Times 5 times 120 per. Okay, so that you multiply that, do some math, you get 162,000 pixels total in the display. But each one of those pixels has subpixels, right? Each one of those pixels has subpixels, right? Now, how many, and each one can, it can, it can display 64 levels of brightness. How many bits does it take to, to display 64 levels of brightness? Six. 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. Six is right. Okay? So, because each subpixel can display 64 levels of brightness, and 2 to the 6 is 64, the number of bits for each subpixel is 6. But there's three subpixels per pixel, so the bit depth is 3 times 6, which is 18. So does everybody see that it's 18 bits per what? Per pixel on the display, right? So the size of the display memory is the product of the number of pixels times the number of bits per pixel, the bit pixels. And so you substitute the values and you get 162,000 times 18 pixels times 18 bits per pixel. Is everybody clear? Do a little math. You get 2,916, what's the little b? Bits. bits. But we want to know it in kilobytes. How many bits in a byte? Eight. Convert to, kilo, to kibby bytes. <laughs> so how do we do that? Divide by eight and then divide by what? Not K I. 1024. Yeah. So nine, times one bit, one byte per eight bits times one K I byte per 1024 bytes. Is everybody clear? So do the math. 356K. Everybody see how that worked? Yeah. Yes. It's because it's RGB in color. It's always three. It's always three color. It's always three pixels per subpixel. Yeah. Actually, with only three pixels per subpixel, it is impo It is physically impossible to produce every color that the eye can see in nature. It's limited by the region by the RGB. To so there are colors that the eye can see that cannot be displayed on a screen. There are colors in nature that the eye can see that cannot be displayed. On, it's, in fact, it's amazing when you look at the area that is not representable. It's amazing that the screens look as good as they do. There's a, there are big regions of, of the color spectrum that are impossible to display on a screen, and yet we have really nice looking images from nature on the screen. It's really quite, it's quite amazing. And here, uh, another uh, little feature of the book, uh, there are, are these sidebars where I show you the, how computers, um, more realistic, I mean how computers, some examples of computers from the real world and the system that, I, that I'm showing here throughout the book is this Intel x86 system. So the Intel chips are, the Intel chips are what are inside all of our laptops and our desktops. And here in figure 1.30, what's one big difference in a real system that you notice that we don't have in our model that we just looked at in this chapter? How many CPUs are in this figure 1.30? There's four. 
there's four. That's the biggest difference. And then the, the, there's more than one bus. It's a little complicated, but the idea is, so this is, you can read about the Intel chipset and how things work in the real world uh, by, looking, by looking at this material. I'll never test you over any of this Intel stuff, okay? Okay, now, so that finishes off the first chapter. The second chapter is a little bit of review about the C programming language. Now, probably many of you have not actually programmed in C. I know everybody has programmed in C++, but C is just a subset of C++. There are a few little quirks that we'll have to learn along the way, but I'm not going to spend a whole lot of a whole lot of time. I'll let you kind of pick this up on your own from reading this material in the chapter. So, chapter two is on the C language, and what at what level? H O L six. All right. So we're at level H O L six, higher order language six, and. When you figure 2.1, show us what happens when you compile a program. When you compile a program, the compiler translates your program written in C at level 6 down to what level? ISA 3. Does everybody see that? That's the machine language level. That's binary. Because your C program is written as, as a string of characters, right? But then the binary, it, you know, translates it to binary, machine language, machine code. And now, here's in figure 2.2. You remember, every computation has what? Input does what? Processing and does what? Produces output, right? Input, processing, output. Now, what does the compiler take for its input? It takes your, pro, your pro, source program written in C, right? And then it processes it and produces what? The object code, which is the same program but written in a different what? Language. Written in machine language. Now, does everybody see that? It would be like if you took English in and you translated it and you had German out or whatever. You see what I'm saying? It's, just, it's a translator. Translates from one, a program at one language to a program at another language. So <clears throat> the lower level language has different instructions, but, but it, it does that translation. And this, <clears throat> this phenomenon of comp compilation, this translation process, this is the main theme, this is the, one of the main things that we want to learn in this course, is that translation process, how it works. Yeah, question? Is, so for different languages, is, like, is machine code universal? Good question. Machine code is not universal. Okay, so it has different for different languages? It has, no, it has different for different operating systems. Oh, okay. Different operating, two things. Different operating systems and different, different conventions for the operating system and different actual hardware instructions. Don't know if you are familiar with this, but you know the Intel chip was the one that we just looked at, but it's probably not the most common chip. Do you know all of your mobile phones, all your mobile devices, you know what chip is in those? ARM, ARM, yeah. And there are many more mobile devices than there are desktop computers and laptop computers. So there's probably more ARM chips than there are Intel chips. But they have a different instruction set. So that, at that ISA level, that's different. Okay. So the question is, how can you write one program in C and have it run on different computers? Because that's possible, right? It's possible to have, write a program in C and have it run on one, you know, on a Windows machine and also have it run on a, on a Unix machine. You see what I mean? Or also have it run on a mobile device. So how can that happen? Well, the way that can happen is, you just you write one program in C, but then you ha you can have one compiler translate it to one language, and then if you want it to run on another machine language, you have a different compiler to translate the same one. So do you, does everybody see how that works? Illustrated here in Figure 2.3. Are we good? So that's how you get machine independence from the high order languages. All right. Are you ready for this memory? 
This is one of the things you're going to have to memorize. The C memory model. There's three parts to it. Okay? And this one is super important. The first part is global variables are stored in a fixed location in memory. Now by memory, what do we mean? Main memory in that model that we have. Are you with me? Global variables are stored in a fixed location of memory. Okay, so let's wipe that out. What's the first part of the C memory model? Global variables stored where? Fixed location of memory. Okay, so global variables, fixed location. Now the second one. Local variables and parameters are stored where? On the runtime stack. What's the first part? Global variables where? Fixed location memory. What's the second one? Locals and what? Parameters on the what? Runtime stack. Question? Is the runtime stack also in the memory? Or is it yes. Good question. The question is, is the runtime stack in main memory? And the answer is emphatically yes. A different part of main memory. And we are going to investigate that in infinite detail. That was an excellent question. Is everybody clear? And what's the third kind? Dynamically allocated variables. This is what happens when you do new. And where are they allocated? In the heap. All right, what's the first one? Global variables where? Fixed location and memory. What was the second one? Locals and what? Parameters on the what? Runtime stack. And what was the third one? Dynamically allocated variables where? From the heap. Now, do we know this? <laughs> All right, so this is super important. Now here's another one. What happens when you call a function? Do you know what happens when you call a... Now, I, I assume that you guys have done some of this stuff in your intro class, right? What happens when you call a function? Something happens on the runtime stack. What happens on the runtime stack? First, you push storage for the return value. Now, what happens on the... What's the first thing? For the what? For the return value. Push storage for the... Now the second thing is, you push the what? The actual, the actual parameters. Now what was the first one? <laughs> I know this is tedious, but this is super important. What is the first one? Storage for the return value. What was the second one? No, you actually push the actual parameter. Not just storage, you actually push the parameters themselves. Not just the storage for them. There's a difference. The third one, does anyone, does anybody, is it, does anybody know what the third one is? It's called the return address. Now why would you want to push the return address? Because when you call a function, eventually what will that function do? It will return. How will it know where to return from? You have to give it the address of where to return to. Does everybody see that? So you push the return address. Now what was the first one? Storage for the return value. What was the second one? Push the actual parameters. And what's the next one? The return address. Okay. Then what happens? Push storage for the local variables. Now, does everybody know what the local variables are inside of the function? Local variables inside the function. All right. And what happens when you return from the function? The same thing, but in the opposite what? Order. Yeah. So first you pop the local variables, then you pop the return address, then you pop the parameters, then you pop the return value. By the way, everybody knows what a stack is, right? What in, what out? Last in, first out. So you push to store and you pop to take off. Is everybody clear? All right, so that is super important. So the three attributes of a C variable, every variable has a name and a type and a value. 
And here in figure 2.4 is our first C program. Oh, by the way, you have an exercise, a problem for Thursday is to write a C program in C. You'll only write one C program this whole time. We'll write one program, we'll study the C language uh, in our other programs. But what you are to do is to write a program in C to uh, solve the Towers of Hanoi problem, which you guys all did in the intro class. Right? So anyway, look, uh, remember, remember, move how many disks from one peg to another peg? So write that program in C. So here's our first program in C, figure 2.4. This is a nonsense program just to illustrate global variables. Now how do we know, you see this care ch and this int j, where are they located? In the main program or outside the main program? Outside. outside. That, me, that makes them what kind of variables? Global. Globals. And where are global variables stored? In a what? At a fixed location in memory. Now, this main is a function. Who calls the function? Who calls main? What calls, what program calls main? Because main is a function, it has to get called. What calls it? No, the compiler does not call it. The compiler translates it. What calls it? Say it again. No, the user, no. Not the user. The user doesn't actually, what piece of code? The user isn't a piece of code. I mean, you see what I'm saying? I mean, what calls the main program? Oh, the OS. Yes, the operating system. The operating system calls the main program. Is everybody clear on that? What is the operating system? It is a what? Is it hardware or software? software. So that means it's a what? It's a program. The operating system is a program written in software. It calls main. Is everybody clear on this? All apps get called by the operating system. Is everybody, are you, is everybody good? What happens when you call a function? What was the first thing? Push what? Storage for the return value. Are you with me? Then what happens? You push the actual parameters, right? How many actual parameters does this main have? Zero. None. It says main paren paren. And what was the third thing? Push the return address. Push the return address. So what is that return address going to be? That's going to be the return address of some place in the operating system. So you see when this function gets called, when this main function gets called, do you see in figure 2.5? This is a picture of the memory model of this function. Does everybody see? Where are CH and N stored? At a what? Fixed location in memory. And do you see that that's the runtime stack for the main program? The ret val is our abbreviation for return value. And the ret address is RA0. That RA0 means return address 0 somewhere in the operating system. And why was that ret val 0? Because if you go back and because you see the last statement in main is return zero. Does everybody see how that worked? Let me just point out, well, I think what we're going to do is we're going to skim over the rest of this uh, C stuff and I'll let you, we'll, we'll, we'll go over a lot of the C, um, some of the C stuff on Thursday, but um, you sh I'm, I don't want to spend time on, in class explaining how to compile a C program. So if you need some help, come see me. You can do it in, either on the command line or you can do it in NetBeans. Uh, is all, for the homework, is all you need is, the, is to write the .c source file for the Towers of Hanoi. Maybe we can use that. And you can come by and get some help from students or me to, on how the mechanics of how to do a, compile a C program. All right, good deal. See you on Thursday. No, that's not right. That's not right. 30, wait, words, wait a minute. The, you're including the space in that 35 words per minute as a character? Yes. No, as, no, 
say at characters per minute. Oh darn, this is, I'm going to have to cut so much of this out. 